for 12 years, iOS was the most secure, consumer-grade mobile operating system. But in the state of mass surveillance, everything's changed. For the period of more than two years, gaping holes in core components of iOS security allowed attackers to remotely hack every version of iOS from at least 2016 until recently. Google's white hat hackers at Project Zero reported attackers were able to remotely take over fully patched and updated iPhones and iPads without any user interaction. They weaponized in total 14 zero-day vulnerabilities in Apple's mobile operating system into five sophisticated exploit chains. Their targets were chosen indiscriminately in what seems to be part of a large mass surveillance campaign by reportedly a state-sponsored adversary. Infected users would immediately have all of their data from their devices uploaded to remote servers and updates sent every 60 seconds. The data collected would include location, device model, keychain, name and serial number, phone number, contacts, messages, attachments, list of installed apps, recordings, photos, files, call history, passwords and container directories of every app on the device. The implant had a hard-coded list of apps from which it always uploaded plain text data to the attacker-controlled servers. Among the selected apps were Gmail, Facebook, Skype, Telegraph, WhatsApp and others. The scariest part is that the attackers were able to bypass end-to-end -end encryption in popular messaging apps like WhatsApp, iMessage and Telegram. Because the exploits gave the attackers full privileges on iOS, they could access and read chat messages in real time before they were encrypted by their apps. Although a simple reboot would kill the exploit, unless a user did so immediately after infection, troves of personal and sensitive data would by then be in the hands of adversaries. What's odd is that all the collected data would be transmitted over HTTP connection with no encryption to hide the activity. Anyone analyzing the network traffic of the victims could see the data in plain text. Some researchers speculate that the attackers were either inexperienced in their craft or they just didn't care if they get caught. Nonetheless, they succeeded in engaging in their hacking campaign undetected for over two years. All of the exploit chain were zero-day and zero-click, which means the attackers found holes in the iOS source code that were not patched by its developers and users would not have to interact with the malware in any way. Simply visiting an infected website would automatically install implant on their device. Project Zero reported in August that the attackers infected a small selection of websites with thousands of visitors per week. Google, which had access to both the infected websites and the IP addresses of the servers controlled by the attackers, did not disclose neither those websites nor those IP addresses. This information could help attribute the attacks and it would inform affected website owners as well as warn their visitors. Apple did not inform infected iOS users and they stayed silent about the exploits until Project Zero published its report. But Google privately informed Apple about this in February 1st this year, more than six months before going public about it. They gave Apple seven days to patch unfixed vulnerabilities and ship the updates to iOS users immediately. Apple did so with the release of iOS 12.1.4 on February 7th. But this is far from the end of the story. More and more investigations and stories were coming to the surface, questioning the traditional premise that iOS security is unmatched and can only be broken through by expensive and highly targeted campaigns. These exploit chains, alongside many other instances of embarrassing holes in the iOS security, suggest, however, that Apple's closed-source, locked-down ecosystem is a center of mass surveillance at much lower cost than previously thought. Last Friday, Apple issued an official statement where they took offense at Google for its Project Zero report. Apple claims the attacks were only narrowly targeted at the Uyghur community. They blamed Google for fear-mongering all iOS users and that all evidence shows the attacks lasted only for two months. Apple claims no responsibility for failing to guard against such wide-scale vulnerabilities. There is no response to Google's main criticism that the vulnerabilities wouldn't have been missed if Apple developers followed standard code reviewing processes. What's missing from the statement is any mention of China, where the majority of Uyghurs reside. There is no sympathy with the Uyghurs, who face decades-long persecution, mass surveillance and human rights abuse by the Chinese government. There are no apologies to the victims, no guidance on what to do with the infected devices, and no explanation of how Apple plans to mitigate against these attacks in the future. So how does Apple hold up against these accusations? Let's dissect this story. 
First, how narrow really were these iOS exploits? Forbes and TechCrunch independently reported the attacks seem to have been targeted at websites serving Uyghur content. What may seem narrow to a trillion dollar behemoth is a never-ending nightmare of ethnic persecution of the Uyghur minority living in the Xinjiang region in northwest China. There are 10 million Uyghurs living in the China's largest state, majority of them Sunni Muslims. The Chinese government put over 1 million Uyghurs into detention camps and subjected the rest of the population to massive hacking campaigns the iOS exploits might as well be part of. With thousands of iOS users getting infected each week over the span of several months or years, the evidence indicates that we need to count victims in hundreds of thousands. Even though Uyghurs might constitute a small number of iOS users for Apple, this was nowhere near a narrow, targeted operation, but rather a mass surveillance campaign focused on a geographical location and an ethnicity. But Uyghurs aren't the only ones in danger of being hacked. Any use of exploits in the wild poses a risk they fall into the wrong hands. US military commanders publicly acknowledged that their adversaries and targets can reverse engineer the tools used against themselves or someone else. A Chinese hacking group once acquired Windows exploits that had been weaponized by the NSA and used for surveillance. The Chinese were able to see the exploits in use by analyzing network traffic of one of the NSA's targets and re-engineer them for their purposes. This is the nature of cyber operations. The more exploits government agencies weaponize, the less secure the whole cyber environment is for everybody. Ironically, the mere existence of the National Security Agency is a security vulnerability. The iOS exploits have been in the wild for too long, at least two years. That's long enough for many malicious actors to spot the exploits, especially since they were used indiscriminately and over unencrypted connections. Many more state-sponsored adversaries have likely used these exploits around the world. Knowing this information, Apple should have launched a deep investigation into these tools and begin warning users who could have been affected. Instead, Apple's argument is that websites were infected only for two months and not two years without showing any evidence for it. Even if it was true, we know that exploits have been in some way used from at least September 2016 and the attackers were supporting their exploit chains since at least iOS 10.0.1 until 12.1.4. Arguing that this was nothing more than just a limited campaign puts millions of iOS users at great risk. Apple remained silent on the main critique that their development processes were inefficient in safeguarding iOS security. And Google had a lot to say about this. The exploit chains were written contemporaneously with their supported iOS versions. This means the attackers were able to move onto a new exploit chain before vulnerabilities in the previous ones were patched. Google's analysis shows that at least two vulnerabilities used in the exploit chains were unpatched at the time of discovery in January 2019. Out of 14 vulnerabilities discovered, 7 were for Safari web browser, 5 for the iOS kernel, and 2 separate sandbox escapes. While the first two exploit chains only lasted through iOS 10, Google argues at least 3 of the 5 exploit chains could have been avoided. The third exploit chain stemmed from a bug Project Zero says could have been discovered by a simple unit test or a code review. Ironically, the vulnerability was found in Apple's IPC mechanism, which they marketed as a security boundary that poses little to no harm if exploited. As it turns out, exploiting XPC bugs allows attackers to target any process which uses it and XPC is riddled with those bugs. The fourth exploit chain also weaponizes an XPC sandbox escape and a kernel bug, which the report argues to be just as easy to find and exploit. These two vulnerabilities were still unpatched at the time of discovery in 2019. The final vulnerability in the exploit chain 5 was introduced because back in 2014, Apple implemented vouchers, a new and unfinished feature that Google says never even worked. Any attempt to use this feature would have caused kernel panic, and the phone would immediately crash. This means that a feature was never called during testing, code review, development, or production. 
This bug was publicly known since November 17, 2018, when a hacker sorting my bed used it to try to win $200,000 bounty competition. Another researcher, Brandon Azad, independently discovered and reported this issue to Apple on December 6, 2018. It still took Apple over two months to finally patch it on January 22, 2019, but it wasn't until the iOS 12.1.4 release on February 7 when it finally reached users. Why is iOS suddenly so vulnerable? Could Apple do more to improve the security of their premium-priced products? As the iOS developed over the years, it became more and more complex and difficult to navigate for cybersecurity researchers. Over the past few years, the attack surface of iOS has significantly expanded. Fully remote attacks on iOS are starting to be a commonplace. The first major remote privilege escalation attack on iOS made headlines in summer 2016. A US-based company used three separate vulnerabilities to build spyware to target a political dissident in the United Arab Emirates. The spyware was completely interactionless. If you received a malicious message through iMessage, without opening it, you would immediately give adversaries access into your iPhone. The exploit could access users' messages, calls, emails, contacts, calendar, and unencrypted data from WhatsApp, Viber, Gmail, Facebook, and others. The exploit would automatically update itself to stay supported alongside iOS versions, and researchers think that it's still used against iPhone users throughout the world. Earlier this summer, Project Zero was evaluating the remote attack surface of the iPhone and found a total of 10 vulnerabilities, most of them in iMessage. iMessage has a very complex source code, a lot of which contributes to the app's attack surface, carries no benefits to users. At the Black Hat Security Conference in Las Vegas, researcher Natalia Silvanovich presented several zero-click iMessage exploits, some of which were still zero-day at the time. It was revealed that iMessage was still vulnerable to fully remote, interactionless takeover through malicious messages just like it was in 2016. Bugs like these are difficult to spot, yet easy to exploit, and the blame is on the app's complexity. With so many features like Animojis, file rendering, and integration with other apps like Apple Pay and iTunes, it's easier to make development mistakes and introduce vulnerabilities. Apple's decades-long strategy has been to keep their ecosystem locked down and closed sores. But when it comes to security, Apple is shooting themselves in the foot. There are many researchers that would like to help strengthen the iOS security, and some even make a business out of it. But because all core components are closed source and secret, it's hard for security researchers to analyze them. Initially, Apple managed to keep iOS secure thanks to its lockdown and uniformity. But over the years, that created a digital monoculture. If somebody finds an exploit chain for iOS, chances are it will work on all iPhones running that version of iOS. Android, that has traditionally been mostly open source, used to be riddled with bugs and severe security issues. But its security vastly increased in recent years because its open architecture invites more eyes to review and improve the source code. Android, while still having a stockpile of its own vulnerabilities, mitigates the problem of universal exploits through diversity of the ecosystem. Almost every brand of smartphone ships somewhat modified version of Android, and an exploit working on one phone could be completely useless on another. The walled garden design is a clever business strategy and it's convenient for users, but it also puts all their eggs in one basket. Apple makes it difficult or impossible to change or delete many of the default apps. Users cannot diversify their devices enough and this uniformity of Apple users simplifies the job for the attackers. All of this manifests itself on the market as well. There are businesses who are brokering exploits on various software and operating systems. One such malware broker, Zerodium, now offers to buy an interactionless zero-day exploit on Android for $2.5 million, while the equivalent on iPhone costs $2 million. The supply of iPhone zero-day exploits is growing so rapidly that for the first time in history, the market is willing to pay more for Android exploits than iOS. The broker says they even had to refuse some iOS exploits because the markets were so flooded with them. Zerodium also decreased rewards for one-click exploits on iOS from $1.5 million to $1 million. The primary clients of malware brokers are governments and state-sponsored adversaries. 
The FBI once broke into a terrorist's iPhone that Apple refused to build backdoor for by purchasing a zero-day exploit from a Grey Hat hacker. It is speculated that the Chinese attackers could have also acquired the iOS exploits from some of these malware brokers. But for the longest time, Apple has been offering far less for securing their products than the rest of the market. At the time of the five exploit chains, Apple offered only $200,000 for zero-click full-chain kernel exploits when brokers and governments offered to pay several times more. Experts in operating system security are very rare, and their talents are highly valued. The calculus for such a researcher is rather straightforward. Be ethical and get a minimal reward for your time by reporting exploits to Apple, or get paid several millions for the same work and somehow rationalize that the people who you sold it to might use it against innocent civilians. Apple is primarily responsible for securing products they are selling to millions of customers worldwide. Many of the exploits could have been avoided if Apple followed rigorous code reviewing and unit testing procedures that would have revealed those bugs to developers before they were abused by malicious adversaries and not afterwards. Give your developers more legroom to make sure the code they are working on is not unnecessarily expanding the attack surface of the system. Creating a monoculture of a closed source ecosystem exposes Apple customers to a great risk of cyber attacks. If Apple cares about its customers, at Apple we put the customer at the center of everything that we do. Openness is the way forward. You can only hide your source code from the people with good intentions. Malicious actors will always find a way around. Open up your source code so that whitehead hackers can make it better and allow your customers to diversify their devices and let them make the ecosystem more resilient to en masse attacks. As a publicly traded corporation with hundreds of billions of dollars in annual profits, Apple should match the market for rewards of cybersecurity research. Digital security is not a place for saving money. Apple is giving itself a blind spot where people with motivation to compromise security of their products are valued more than people who want to improve it. No system is unhackable, and mistakes will always happen. This reality needs to be acknowledged rather than frowned upon when somebody points legitimate criticism. Nobody can make a perfectly secure system, but when security is breached, victims need to be offered help and guidance, and not silence and corporate damage control. iOS users weren't the only ones targeted by mass surveillance campaigns. A different cybersecurity company, Velexity, published a report about a set of exploits targeting Android users. But this report revealed a lot more useful information about who was targeted and who might have been behind it. The hacking campaign targeted 11 websites serving Uyghur and Turkistan-related content. All of these websites are banned in mainland China, which means the campaign likely targeted Uyghurs living abroad. The attacks on Android were slightly different than the ones on iOS. They didn't remotely take over all of the data on the device. Rather, the exploits exfiltrated mostly identifiable information about the device and its user, and not necessarily messages from end-to-end -end encrypted apps. However, this information is vital in further identifying and attacking their targets. The attackers were able to spoof domains of Google, the Uyghur Academy, and Turkistan Times to avoid network detection. They would compromise targeted websites and infect them with malicious code, mostly through iframes. iframe is basically website embedding. It's a useful tool when you want to serve content from other websites without redirecting your visitors away from your domain. A YouTube video embedded in a blog post is a classic example of an iframe. In this case, the iframes would be invisible. In this particular example, it has zero pixels in width and height, and it appears legitimate by replacing the letter i with lowercase l. The code would then target Chrome browser on Android and install an implant on the device. What's oddly similar to the iOS exploits is that the Android malware would also not stay on the device, nor would it extract any further information. This could mean the campaign was just scanning for their targets and future exploitation can be expected. Another striking similarity with the iOS campaign is that all compromised data was transmitted over unsecured HTTP channel. This is a useful hint, because Velocity attributes these attacks to at least two China-based hacking groups. While it still remains unclear who specifically was behind the iOS attacks, it seems the Chinese government is the only adversary with enough motivation and resources to target Uyghur, iOS, and Android users. It seems like from what we know, these same websites could have been used for the iOS exploits as well, although a clear evidence for it is yet to be provided. 
and probably most of the malicious code was also vectored in through iframes. If that is true, then defending against this attack vector is quite easy for a user of any operating system. Iframes can be easily blocked by a range of browser extensions. The easiest method is to use uBlock Origin. Enable Advanced User Mode in the settings and then make the rectangle next to the third-party frames red. Click the padlock to make the change permanent and uBlock Origin will from now on block all iframes by default. It will also allow you to graphically see what network requests are being made on the websites you're visiting. If you want to be extra secure, you can block all third-party requests and especially block all JavaScript. I highly recommend doing all of that, but the least you should absolutely do is to block iframes. If you end up blocking content that you want to see, such as embedded YouTube videos, you can easily set no operation by turning rectangles next to those domains gray. Another easy solution is to block all unencrypted traffic. It's 2019. If there is any website that uses HTTP rather than encrypted HTTPS tunnel, you should not go to that website. Install HTTPS everywhere and set it to block all unencrypted traffic. You will get a warning before you can access an encrypted website, which you can locally disable, but at that point you should ask yourself what are you doing on that website. Doing these steps doesn't make you unhackable, nothing does. But the market for browser-based, fully remote, privilege-escalating exploits is booming. If you efficiently block all scripts by default, then you cannot be attacked through this vector. I will leave you with a quote from Ian Beer, a security researcher at Project Zero. To be targeted might mean simply being born in a certain geographic region or being part of a certain ethnic group. All that users can do is to be conscious of the fact that mass exploitation still exists and behave accordingly. Treating their mobile devices as both integral to their modern lives, yet also as devices which when compromised can upload their every action into a database to potentially be used against them. Stay vigilant.